Stephen. Uh, so I have four very short uh, micro slash flash fiction pieces for you tonight. I'm going to end with one piece from She is a Beast, a different piece that John um, read a little bit for you. Uh, so the first piece that I'm going to read is uh, going to be in a similar vein as She is a Beast, which is a collection of feminist fairy tales. Um, so this story is in a similar vein, but not from the book. Uh, it's called Crying Wolf, and it was published in Resurrection Mag uh, at the end of 2020. And I'll just give a content warning that it does contain references to sexual assault. Crying Wolf, fairy tale. Once upon a time, there was a girl, the prettiest who was ever seen. One day, her mother asked her to bring some cakes to her grandmother who lived in the woods. On her way, she met a wolf. He was handsome and charming and offered to play a game. Let's race to see who gets to Granny's first, he said. The wolf arrived first, of course. He swallowed Granny whole, and when the girl knocked on her grandmother's door, the wolf opened it. I win, he said. Then he swallowed her too. Real life. She didn't meet the wolf in the woods, but inside of her house. Her bedroom, in fact. He wasn't charming or handsome or even a stranger. He was Mr. Stevens, her father's best friend. He visited at night when her father had passed out on the couch, crumpled beer cans dripping on the floor, leaving stains that would never come out. The wolf pressed the girl against the mattress, his knee in between her ribs. Don't say a word, he warned. Victim. She said a word, many of them in fact to her parents, but they didn't believe her. Rick wouldn't do that, her father said. Are you sure it was him, honey? Her mother asked. She avoided her daughter's eyes, pretended the purple bruises resembling claw marks on her daughter's thighs were invisible. Wolf. I never touched her, he said. She's the same age as my daughter, Elizabeth. I would never hurt a little girl. Hero. It happened more than once, the girl told the police. She had snuck out of school and walked to the precinct without anyone knowing, certainly not her parents, who she knew would never believe her. I have proof, she said. She pulled out her phone and pressed play. It wasn't hard to get him to confess on tape. His hunger for her was never satiated. He wanted to relive her devouring again and again. After, when the wolf knew he was boxed in, when he knew he was no longer the predator in the woods, but now prey, he said the girl asked for it with her red cheerleader costume. He could say what he wanted, the girl thought. He wouldn't get the chance to hunt girls anymore where he was, and that was the only ending she cared about. Thank you. So that's the first piece. Uh, so this next story, uh, I'm still in the process of submitting. It hasn't found a home yet, but hopefully it will soon. Uh, and this story is based off of one of my favorite places in Philadelphia, uh, the Laurel Hill Cemetery. This is called Namesake. You named me after three tombstones in Laurel Hill Cemetery. Your freckled hand on your swollen belly, your light gray eyes scanning the marble and granite slabs, you were running out of time. You said it was the touch of cinnamon in the August air. Autumn was coming early, and so was your baby. I pictured you like this, your strawberry blonde hair aflame in the boiling summer sun, your bangs glued to your forehead in thin strings. At St. Mary's, the other girls called me Soprana. I tried to tell them that Sophrana came from the ancient Greeks, meaning sensible and self-controlled, but they were just little girls, given names like Sally and Christy and Tara and Joan. On my 13th birthday, you wrote to tell me the origin behind my middle name, Viola. It had belonged to the daughter of a wealthy stonemason, Viola L. Charles. The L stood for Lucretia. They lived on the cusp of the city near the cemetery at 18, Viola drowned in the Schuylkill. She wanted to prove to her father she was as good a rower as her older brother, John. 
There was a dense fog that morning and Viola's boat hit a rock, tossing her overboard. Being a woman in a family that cherished men, no one had ever thought to teach her how to swim. You said it was a sad story, but important nonetheless. Viola was fearless and I should be too. Your letter arrived on Thursday, three days before my 18th birthday. The yellow envelope reeked of earth and incense. Lavender fell, then faded parchment. I knew you lived in a small community in upstate New York. Sister Constance called you hippies. Her face pinched as she spoke. You said you lived with free thinkers, that one day I could visit. Yet you had never visited me. I enrolled the letter, spellbound by its contents. You wanted to meet on my birthday at the cemetery where you named me. There, you said, you would tell me the origin of my surname, Wood. My chest hummed with longing. My hands trembled, reaching out to the mother I'd never met. I find Jeremiah Wood's tombstone, taking the path you described. The stone is speckled with time and bird droppings. Born June 6, 1801, died January 7, 1845. My fingers hover over the grave, daring to caress it. He was an artist, you say, from behind me. Your voice is huskier than I imagined. I study the name and dates carved into the stone. He painted murals before the city was covered in them. I wanted you to be creative. My heartbeat th thrums in my fingers. I turn to face you. Your eyes are dark blue with thin lines crowding the skin around them, your hair a deep mahogany. You are nothing like I imagined, nothing, looking nothing like me, yet still, you're my mother. Kai mom, I say. You smile, the lines by your eyes deepening. So thank you, that's the second piece. So I'll read just one more piece before I get to a very short one from She is a Beast. Uh, this story is called Flower Box and it was published in Yes Poetry. On a Monday, my husband comes home with supplies. From the bed of his truck, he unloads a plethora of wood, redwood, cedar, Douglas fir. He chatters their names and properties to me. It is though new life has been breathed into him. It is the first time he seemed happy since B. On a Wednesday, I wake to the percussion of hammering. I lean in the back doorway of the house, my hand a visor to shield my eyes from the early morning sun. He had told me what he planned to build, but it had seemed so imaginary, like everything since B. On a Friday, he plants a completed flower box in front of my scrambled eggs and coffee. I nod at it, try and fail at a closed mouth grin. I'm not sure the muscles in my face remember how to do that. Can you forget how to smile? My husband beams at me all teeth and I want to return his joy, but there is no warmth in my chest, only caverns and echoes. On a Sunday, he calls me outside, voila, he says, his arms waving in a great flourish. He thinks he's a great showman. Nothing seems great or even good to me anymore, so I simply nod. He has filled his first planter, made from cedar, with an array of colorful flowers, geraniums that remind me of red lollipops, cotton candy pink petunias, grape-colored zinnias, he is the Willy Wonka of flowers, it seems, a caricature of himself. With my tongue, I form the words, it looks nice, honey. I shape the syllables two, three times before venturing to speak. My husband needs a win, and I want to give him that. But then I see the white chrysanthemums slipped in among the candy flowers. For Bethany, he says, seeing I've noticed, they were her favorite. Her sugary, syrupy voice calls me saying, look, mommy, look at me. Her head thrown back in laughter as she swings on the monkey bars in defiance of gravity in the unwavering belief that she at age seven was invincible. The cavities in my chest throb, the stalactites tremble in their plots. I work to form the words, my tongue folding and bobbing in my mouth. 
I know my husband built the flower box in honor of B and what he thought to be a nice gesture. I try to tell him it looks nice, honey, or thank you, but when I look at the cedar box with the candy flowers, all I can see is a coffin, another coffin for B. Thank you. So just one more piece, and this one will be from She is a Beast. Um, and uh, John had actually, this is, he has the poster version of this story, um, which is faux fairy tale. Um, this is a reimagining of Sleeping Beauty. Uh, and you will see that it is a, thank you, John. <laughs> yes. You will see that uh, this is a very different type of Sleeping Beauty than you might be familiar with. Uh, so this is faux fairy tale. You stand over me like I'm a sleeping child, something precious and simple and beautiful. I may be sleeping, but I am no child, nor am I anything like you think I am. Your breath is loud and heavy, like a saw chewing through wood, its appetite never satisfied. I wish you would shut your mouth or stop breathing, whatever quiets you faster. Did you eat a dead raccoon on your way here? Because your breath smells like rotten onion and garlic and meat. As your stink spews onto my face in thick puffs, you say, damn, you're beautiful. You say the things I'd like to do to you. I can hear your fat, sweaty tongue licking your lips. You say these things to me, your voice booming, echoing off the stone walls and floor. Yet your words are the kind of truth People only speak when they know you're full of cough medicine or tequila, having the deepest sleep of your life, or when they whisper so low, the quiet pop of their lips brushing against each other is the only thing audible. You don't think I can hear you. You think our love story starts after the kiss, and anything before is unseen, unheard, a ghost that can be banished with ease. Like the others, you're an idiot. I can hear every fucking word you say. You think you're the first to hack away the thorny hedges and to climb the 20 foot iron gates. You think you're the first to find me, a seemingly perfect woman in a lavish bedroom chamber, one who's alive yet unconscious, one who's silent, just how you like her. You think you're going to save me as though I'm not exactly where I want to be. I'm telling you, buddy, you don't want to kiss me. You don't want to wake me up because if you do, you'll learn real quick that I don't match up to your image of me. I am loud and crude and I won't let you fuck me the way you like. And I refuse to call you daddy or big boy or any other gross dirty talk you're into. So let's just skip the shit, shall we? Don't lay a finger on me. Don't bring that wheezing, rank smelling mouth near me and nobody gets hurt, okay? This won't end in happily ever after. I can promise you that. So thank you so much. Um, so like John said, uh, my book, She is a Beast, is available to order. You can order it either through a novel idea or directly through the publisher, APEP Publications. Um, and then just the last thing I want to say is that um, through a novel idea, I'm actually hosting a reading on Friday called Through the Woods, which is featuring um, Rachel Hanlon Rodriguez, who's on this call somewhere, as long as myself and some one other wonderful writers reading work inspired by fairy tales. I'll drop the link in the chat to that if you're interested, but otherwise, thank you so much.